Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the conversation from the trenches. And uh, today we are going to be talking about something that is deeply personal, as always. And it is also a very critical conversation, I think, for all of us to have, particularly us women, and more so for young girls. And the reason I say it's critical, and the reason I say it's personal is because, you know, we hear a lot of conversations about body image, and we hear a lot of conversations about body positivity. We are told that we must have a good relationship with our body, we must accept ourselves, we must love ourselves, so on and so forth. But we all know how difficult it is, right? It's not the easiest thing to do. And the reason why I said, you know, just before I came on this live, I was a little surprised and a little dismayed, I would say, when the mother of an eight-year-old told me that she was having a difficult time telling her daughter how to accept her body. Now, this child is by no means, uh, you know, she's not on the plus side. She's not. She's just a healthy, beautiful young girl. And she's upset about a little tummy that she has and her baby fat. And when I was when I heard this and when I was listening to this lady talk, it struck me that we often think about body image and our bodies in the context of wanting to be beautiful and wanting to be appreciated. Right. But clearly it runs deeper than beauty. It, it correlates to the way we show up in the world, the way we walk into any space. And, you know, in the leadership circles, we talk about presence and executive presence and how we show up. How do we show up with confidence? How do we show up with authenticity? How are we experienced as being authentic? Now, we really have no clue how to deconstruct it, right? And if we, it's harder because we live in a world that's filled with triggers. So today I have with me Sunanda Pati. Sunanda is an embodied art space facilitator. Sunanda is the founder of Gaya Comes to the City. Those of you who have been following our conversations will know that if Sunanda is on the show, we are going to be talking about the body. And we are going to be, you know, deconstructing our relationship with the body and trying to unpack it and walk away from this conversation wiser. So welcome, Sunanda. Thank you, Rekha. Thanks for having me yet again. Um, oh. It's a subject that is quite <laughs> triggering for me uh, uh, as much as I think it, it is for a lot of other women. Yes. Uh, but uh, like you said, it's because because it is triggering, it must be spoken about, you know, because Absolutely. I feel like it is through discomfort that we, um, we move towards comfort. Yes. Um, and uh, if we if we do not address um, you know subjects like these, yes, uh, on the surface it might seem like we are doing okay, uh, yeah. but what we are essentially doing is we are just repressing or we are just making do, as they say. I I agree with you. Uh, you know I agree with you two hundred percent because for me I have gone through most of my life being uncomfortable in my skin. And again, as I say, this is not about being beautiful. It's not about having a great figure. It's not about it. Being uncomfortable in your own skin is one of the worst things that, you know, it's a worst, it's a worst burden you can carry. Because a lot of times you're ap almost apologetic for yourself. You're not owning your skin. You're not comfortable. You're squirming in your skin. Now imagine you walk into any room and you're not comfortable in your skin. That's like the worst thing, you know, that's like the worst headspace to be in. And so many of us are in this headspace. So many of us are struggling. And the fact of it is if we talk about it, and if we are, if you're able to say, hey, me too, we know that there is hope for us because we are able to talk. It's a safer space for us. We normalize not being comfortable in our skins and through that find a way forward. So I'm really very grateful you're here to have this conversation, Sunanda, because I know you do a lot of work with the body. And uh, I want to just jump right in. I can see some some people have joined us. So please say hello. Please tell us who you are, where you come from. If you have questions during the conversation, please pop it in the chat box. Uh, if you have observations or sharings that you want to share, experiences, please share that as well. This is a conversation for all of us. So Sunanda and I may be in the studio, but really, this is for all of us. And we would love for you to jump right in with your voices. So uh, Sunanda. Very clearly from, you know, the initial conversation that we've been having, it's very obvious that the body is an important aspect of the way we 
present ourselves. It's a, it's a very important aspect of our presence in any space at any point in time. And so is our body language, right? Now, when we are in a position of leadership, and when I talk about leadership, it's not in a corporate context. It's just you even leading your life with, you know, making those micro choices, right? It still is a very critical aspect to have, right? So can we just start by deconstructing it and starting from the absolute basics? What are the linkages between power, our personal power, presence, and the body? Hmm. Great question, uh, and I, I, I'm happy that we are beginning at the basics. Um, as much as our current lifestyle has to do with the mind, um, if you see, we do a lot of work with the mind. We are in front of the systems. We are in, you know, we are doing a lot of intellectual work, mental work. Uh, what is true is that at any point in time, it is our body that is holding all of it together. However, because of the nature of our lives and um, how we have moved away from physical work mm -hmm. uh, and a more naturally physical lifestyle, mm -hmm. I think what has happened in the larger collective mm -hmm. is that we have become quite dissociated from the body. So when uh, a deeper dissociation happens, uh, yeah. I think multiple things happen. Mm -hmm. the, the first thing is that you conceptualize presence, mm -hmm. but you might actually not be present. Yeah. Or, you know, as we were once discussing, um, you know, you, you talk about stances, like, yeah. oh, this is a power stance. But yes. what does it mean? You know, yeah. I am I am closing my arms in front of my body. Yeah. What's happening to my breath? Yes. How are my muscles feeling? Yeah. Am I in pain? Am I in comfort? Is am I really feeling powerful? I know this is called a power stance, but am I really feeling powerful? So yeah. I think what I'm trying to say is our physicality mm -hmm. truly defines mm -hmm. how we connect with ourselves and hence the world. Right. It is our physicality that, uh, you know, that is truly, it's, 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 we go back to our physicality, like we brush our teeth in the morning, we take a bath. If you yeah. see, those are, those are considered to be very everyday, mm. but we do them as a way to return to ourselves. Mm. And by doing that, we connect with the world. Mm. So I think that's how power, presence and body are linked. Mm -hmm. They are actually the one and the same thing. If you, you know, if, if, if I have to talk about it, they are the one mm -hmm. and the same thing after a point. Right. You cannot actually distinguish. Right. So where does body image come in into this, into this triad? Um, body image is very interesting because, um, you know, like in, in my work with myself, my own inner work and in my work with people, Mm -hmm. um, what I have consistently seen is there is a big difference between the actual body of the person. And when I say the person, I just don't mean a client. I even mean myself, mm -hmm. uh, the body and mm -hmm. the body image, mm -hmm. because the image is the perception you have about your own body. Right. And I, I especially say this because I have been a person who naturally likes sports, likes mm -hmm. to be in shape, mm -hmm. but it's not like, okay, it's part, I will not say that it is not about beauty. I, I like the aesthetics that, you know, that happens when I take care of my body. Mm -hmm. but it has also been about feeling good. Yeah. However, if you take it really far, mm -hmm. then the body perception can become a fixation. Mm -hmm. And fixating on the body image actually mm -hmm. move, could po not moves away, but could potentially move us away from a more embodied experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 
if if some if let's say now now i'm simply talking about what is not so great let's say some you know because we talk about body image in the in the context of oh you know it's not so great yeah. relationship is not so great but let's say somebody has a good body image of their own right yeah. they or they get there yeah. i think that overall sense of who they are their comfort in their own skin as you were using that phrase yeah. that yeah. changes and naturally the power they experience in their own skin changes hence the way they relate to the world changes i think authenticity comes in when yeah yeah, yeah. you know when there is let's say a healthier body image um, in the scenario right so you know um one of the one of the conversations it's a persistent conversation in the mainstream and it's largely focused on women women are constantly being told that they should love themselves and love their bodies and accept their bodies i mean i know this is very this is a gender neutral conversation i mean this is a gender neutral topic but it clearly there are it's focused or most of the conversations are focused on women and clearly women are dealing with a lot of that you know that lot of that chatter in the mainstream as we call it right because they're constantly be told step into your power and own your power you know women's day is right around the corner i've had two uh, groups of two corporates who reached out and said we want a session we want you to talk and women to walk away owning their power and i'm always very amused when i hear that because it's almost as if the power is extrinsic to you and not something that's a part of you right so it comes back to the relationship we women have with our bodies according to you since you work with the body what is a kind of relationship we should be having with our body so we should aspire to build with our body and what is the kind of image that we should be you know how should we relate to our bodies what's the kind of body image that we should be having or aspiring to have so that we are able to command presence we are able to show up with you know our entire presence with the power of all of us in any moment mm -hmm. so one thing i know is that um um and I, i i keep thinking about this a lot for my own sake and for the sake of the people i work with mm -hmm. i really feel when we use the phrase body image mm -hmm. um we are only essentially talking about the the sense of sight right you know the perception is the visual right but in developing a relationship with the body we yeah. have we cannot just stay with the visual and i'm not saying that the visual staying with the visual is wrong no we can't i mean our sight like most of the world like if we if we um take the five senses Mm -hmm. almost the entire world is visual oriented right you know and maybe you know it's it's not intrinsic to how the world works but how we have culturally uh, evolved as a collective mm -hmm. and i'm talking about the larger collective here right of course different countries have different cultures but and like you said women tend to have a huge carry a huge amount of pressure around body image mm -hmm. so i don't think there is a should here with the image because i personally think and i have seen that it is a process mm -hmm. the process of discovering mm -hmm. how you would like to relate to your body mm -hmm. but i think the the process often involves people getting in touch with their other senses and not just their like mm -hmm. okay how do i feel yeah for example yeah. how do i feel do i really feel odd like when yeah. you say for example you, you know someone faces the mirror yeah now the first thought might come oh you know this dress doesn't look that great on me yeah now the secondary layer of questioning is who said so yeah you know is it coming from me has it come from somewhere else hmm. and if i just pause or park this question for a minute how yeah. do i really feel in this dress hmm. even say let's say even if it is different from 2 years ago yeah 
in this moment, how do I feel? So I think a lot of the, um, if we really need to own our power, yeah. we need to stay in the now, in the body. Yeah, you know, what you say is very interesting. And uh, however, I also noticed something, you know, with women, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons I wanted to focus this conversation on women and girls is because women, the bodies of women and girls undergo a lot of change very quickly, very, very quickly. And the hormones have a lot to do with it. Plus the fact that, you know, your body is changing, right? And const the way we respond to change is often, it's, it's not commensurate to the rate of change, if that makes sense, right? Because uh, I see so many girls who come into, you know, and, and as their bodies start developing as young adults, there's a huge discomfort. The transition from girlhoodness, a girl body to the woman's body is challenging. And then from the woman's body into a mother's body, right? And when I say the mother's body, it's not about a physical motherhood. A lot of women tend to start putting on, you know, the metabolism slows, the hormonal phase changes. So your body starts looking more maternal, more, um, you know, more not girlish, more womanly. And the womanliness of it starts changing. With, it's not even a one size fits all, right? So I do see a lot of people who are struggling. And, you know, when we talk about visual vis-a-vis -vis the other senses, I've actually heard women who have said, oh, you know, I actually fit into the clothes that I wore 10 years ago. And there's a sense of pride in it. So there's so much, it's so much of, the sense you get is they're holding themselves to standards, mm -hmm. which are not realistic to who they are in the now. Mm -hmm. Like I can be in the now, but mm -hmm. I may not like the fact that my hair is graying. Mm -hmm. Or I may be in the now, but I may have a body that slow down so much that I look nothing like what I was even two years ago. And that bothers me, right? So these are these are some of the thoughts that come up to my mind. And I would love to hear what you have to, what do you think about that? Hmm. So when I say being in the now, I think I am talking really about embodiment, mm -hmm. not just knowing that, oh, let's say I am 40. Yeah. The knowledge is different from embodying that 40. Like yeah. that 40 has come along. Yeah. The 40 has its own process has its own yeah. uh, ups and downs has its own yeah. story and yeah. my 40 is not like another woman's 40 yeah you know to also i think it is very important to talk about how women fall prey um, fall into the prey of comparisons or yeah. fall prey to comparisons you know because and it is not essentially our fault it yeah. is how we have it, it is the conditioning out there in the culture right you know right from the time a girl is small okay look yeah. at the magazines look at these actresses and like who are you looking up to like these pancake yeah. faces end of the day yeah. i mean yeah. i have nothing against people who do makeup but in the context of a healthy body image what are you looking up to then decides yeah how are you going to feel say 10 years later because it's a it's a build up right and like you were saying right like what is the rate of change is it commensurate to how we are able to accept modify integrate experience yeah. and then embody right thanks for, thank you for sharing that because i kind of you know like i said uh, every time i hear somebody uh, talk about body image and their relationship with their body it's always striking me that they're not happy you know there's a grudging acceptance it's a very grudging sort of a, i don't want to get old i don't want to there's a lot of resistance which i think causes people a lot of misery but you made a really important point about the environment it's not really our fault it's the environment we are in and in the context of environment something that we all know about that we all talk about are triggers right we use the word triggers the mainstream uses the word triggers very easily very casually if you ask me in a multiple in multiple contexts mm -hmm. and uh, 
I don't, a lot of times I don't find the conversations have depth about understanding what it means to be triggered. How does it work? And why does the, why is being triggered, uh, you know, why does that have the potential to bring us down, right? Put us in a tailspin and take us down. So can I, can I invite you to just deconstruct triggers for us in the context of body image? Um, yeah. So trigger, basically, I will start with the most basic explanation of a trigger. It is, it is a, a, a kind of a stimulation mm -hmm. that makes us feel a certain way mm. and typically not in a great way. Yeah. Because we never say, oh, this triggered happiness in me. Hmm. I felt joy, you know, yeah. or this, we don't talk like that. So triggers are basically about the not so great stuff that we would rather yeah. not feel, but we end up feeling, right? Yeah. So in terms of body image, I think the tr triggers are, can be so varied and can be so crazy. It's not funny yeah. because I feel the triggers are oftentimes external mm -hmm. but for women because they have mm. uh, they got they get conditioned to experiencing their bodies in a certain way over a period of time they yeah. internalize some of these triggers so mm. even if even if something is not explicitly outside the mm. the inner critic might be throwing up triggers Mm, 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 mm. you know like for example i'm facing the mirror and it has happened to me this is not you know yeah. this is not the client's example it's from my own example like yeah. during covid because uh, i used to have a really really you know active lifestyle before covid set in i became mm. lazier during covid i stopped cycling mm -hmm. i my my rate of running reduced and mm -hmm. the first thing that i used to think of when i would look at the mirror is oh god Hmm. And this would keep on happening until I caught myself saying, oh, God. Yeah. You know, so the trigger was internal, but the trigger could also be external. Like, for example, there could be a plan to go out shopping and then you're shopping for dresses. But let's say you've been somebody's been feeling a little heavier yeah. and they're like, OK, everybody else is buying dresses. It could just, you know create no, a whole, or they discover a picture from, you know, mm. maybe five years ago. Mm. They happen to, and I, I want to say this here. I don't know whether, uh, you know, this would be right for everybody's instance or not. Mm. But I know for a fact that I have a past fixation and I always think like now looking at, looking back at what I'm seeing, oh, I must, I was so happy then, but that's not true. Yeah. You know, like I see an old picture. Oh, I must have been this. I must have been so happy. I look happy here. But at that time, I was comparing myself to something else. Right. Right. So my, so my point is that, uh, you know, we we have to catch ourselves in mm. the act mm. sometimes to, mm. to really see the triggers. And the triggers can be even comments like I was reading something on um, body shaming recently. Yeah. And this, this, this author, she mentioned that uh, she does a lot of work apparently now with supporting women to have like a healthier relationship yeah. after they've been body shamed. But she, yeah. she, in that article, she says, you know, it started with my father yeah. telling me when I was 12 years old, that if you, if you if you continue to eat like that, you'll be da da da. You know, fill in the blanks. I mean, something yeah. really derogatory and yeah. something that no ten year old, no twelve year old should ever have to listen to. Absolutely, I, I I that resonates very deeply because I think I've shared this many times on the lives that I grew up with a lot of body shaving, and I grew up with a lot of slut shaving also. So that was a potent combination. Because, you know, on the one side, you're told that, you you know, I, I was actually called a jackfruit. That was what my, fa you know, a lot of people in my family would call and call me. And, uh, you know, so when you're, you already have this perception that your body is not good enough. And then you get slut shamed on top of it. So it's like a double whammy. 
right? And I do know that for the greater part of my adult life, I would cover myself up because I didn't want to be seen. And I also know now in retrospect, you know, when I look back and I, I know that one of the consequences of, uh, you know, having that poor body image, wanting to cover up meant I would always walk into a room as a leader, as anything, and I would always be wondering, am I covered enough? Can they not, you know, am I hidden away? Am, you know, is somebody judging me? It's, it's like a script running at the back of your mind, right? So mm -hmm. I want to kind of, uh, you know, take this conversation a little deeper here. And so that, you know, when you said you have, we have to recognize it, right? How do we recognize? What are ways in which we can recognize when we are triggered? And, uh, you know, how do we, how do we catch ourselves? What are, what are those few points where we can catch ourselves? One of the basic, th basic things that I have seen work for myself and for some of my clients is irrespective of whether you have body image issues or not, mm -hmm. um, get into the intentional practice of understanding your own self-talk. Mm -hmm. See, it could be a bit of a pressure if somebody is doing it. Oh, I have to do it only when I'm talking about my body. That could be a bit yeah. of a pressure. Yeah. But okay, what? how do I speak to myself? Like I am eating one extra muffin. Yeah. Let's say, right? Yeah. Mm. How am I speaking to myself? Like, for example, I can tell you there have been times I have been, I don't know why I've been so harsh. Yeah. Of course, you know, a part that is, uh, more stable in her thought process and her, in her action, she has just quietened that other part down and I've eaten mm -hmm. the muffin anyway. But I'm saying, right. why should that process be so painful? Okay. So if I can catch myself like, oh, you know, why am I berating myself for wanting one extra muffin on this day? Right. So I think a general intentional practice of hearing ourselves you right. know when we hear we hear other people we hear the world we hear news we hear our neighbors we hear our colleagues but what's happening to our internal ears do we hear ourselves yeah right absolutely right so i want to i want to kind of uh, you know uh, I'm, I'm very curious to know because uh, clearly you know in the conversation so far we've we've thrown up a few uh, topics that can trigger uh, a body image, uh, you know, that can trigger body image pain within us. I would call it pain. I, I don't know a better word to use out here. Have you observed patterns, broad patterns amongst women? And ha have you seen, you know, any of these broad patterns, not just with your clients, but in general? And how have you seen it affect women? Um... I think the, the 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 most general pattern I have seen is, I mean, if I have to just call out the steps in which it happens or the way I have seen, let's say there is a larger uh, container of all these different stories. Like everybody has a very different story. Right. Everybody's story in that way personally is exactly the same as someone else. But I think we do have larger containers hmm. uh, to hold these stories, hmm. um, psychological or the pattern container. Let's say there is a pattern container. So hmm. I have what I have usually noticed is the trigger happens. Hmm. You know the, it, the the original incident. Let's say not, it's not even a trigger. The original incident happens where you know there is somehow shame, a comparison. Something happens the girl has girl or woman has felt like oh something is inherently wrong with me yeah so it's not even like okay there is something wrong about uh, about an aspect of me so yeah. it is so deeply shameful yeah that it is personalized also very deeply mm. and then women typically want to make themselves small yeah make themselves not be seen yeah think that uh, maybe they don't matter yeah 
or they have to intrinsically change something so desperately yeah that only then they will be accepted so mm -hmm. acceptance which ideally should be i i'm very wary of using the word should because i know for a fact that shoulds are you know yeah they're heavy they're very heavy. yeah yeah they're very heavy and you know in a way the word should be many things but it is not um, <laughs> but ideally uh, acceptance is just there but the fact but what causes the pain i i believe and i have when i have this deconstructed it for myself and for my clients what i have seen is the pain is actually about returning to ourselves in the original state of acceptance that already is there but can you, once, make, can you make that a little granular because i think you know just for us to understand in an everyday yeah. context right yeah. that's really yeah. great yeah so it's like i am here i have eaten a muffin mm. and i okay i like it i like sweets i like chocolate i've eaten a muffin i accept it that's it end of story i'm not thinking about it anymore but mm. let's say because you brought up the phrase body image pain yeah i think i'm i am addressing that so what happens yeah. with body image pain is this whole process becomes like this arduous process where you have to actually sit down you have to talk to yourself because yeah. the trauma is old right right you know because the trauma is old the process becomes more and more like a and see a lot of us heal from it and as much as healing is slow yeah the 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 the, the whole thing of coming back to ourselves is i think the pain right i i agree with you you know when you say the coming back to ourselves because i'm closer to 50 and a lot of conversations that swirl around me relate to age and it relates to menopause and you know although there's no past trauma i would say the trauma that a lot of people have is this belief that oh yes menopause is very difficult it's very challenging mm -hmm. it's end of life as we know it right mm -hmm. and a lot of people are drawing reference points from their mothers and their grandmothers and of course we don't have conversations about it so that's a whole different can of worms out there right but i also know that a lot of people struggle to come to that point of saying i'm aging that's natural and to accept it right because they're clinging on to something that was and that is past and that time is up right so uh, I, I get what you mean by saying that it's the pain of coming back to where we are at. Right? Exactly. What I was mentioning about knowing I am 40, yeah. but embodying I am 40, that yes. I am not 30 anymore. And 40 has its own story and has its own changes and has its own process. Absolutely. Exactly. You got that right. Absolutely. And I think that's the, for me, Particularly, I mean, it's not that I'm on top of it. I also go through my moments of grieving the loss of my youth and wondering, oh my God, what's ahead? But, you know, what I've also realized is when you spend a lot of time holding on to a standard that doesn't apply to our present, we also lose, we also lose the opportunity to explore the present with curiosity. Like, what does 40 mean? To embody it, I guess you have to know, you have to be open to say, oh, what does it mean? Let me see what 40 is all about, right? But I also note that we live in an environment which is loaded, which holds us to very high standards, like youth and a certain size and a certain breast size, a body size, uh, so on and so forth, skin, you name it, we are held to standards, right? And then we, we have triggers. We, we live in an environment that's loaded with triggers, if you ask me. I think to a large extent, we don't even realize how much of triggers are embedded in our everyday environment, right? So how do we manage our trigger exposure? Because, you know, you may want to make all those changes. You may want to, you know, be curious about where you're at and embody. But if you're constantly living, it's like walking through a minefield. And if you're constantly having these triggers playing at the back of your mind, how do you how do you manage that the trigger exposure and the activation? 
Um, it's interesting that you draw the the there is a demarcation that you draw between trigger exposure and activation. Yeah. I think not much can really be done about the trigger exposure mm. unless there is a conscious effort to like how some people do digital detoxing. Yeah. You know, yeah. like go off all unnecessary platforms yeah. where especially there's a lot of exchange and there's, you know, people putting up their pictures and uh, mm. talking about their, you know, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, the parties, their holidays and how they look and how somebody else looks and fashion and all that. Yeah. So that is one intentional way. However, mm -hmm. I think because the environment is already controlling the external can be mm -hmm. very, very difficult. We do not, we do not. And the problem I think also is because our work our jobs, yeah. our day-to-day -day things that we actually need to get done is also happening through the same channels that we feel triggered by, which is why I'm saying what I'm saying. Hence, yeah. I think the exposure, it is a debatable topic about what we can really do about the exposure, but the management yeah. is possible by... Yeah. You know, doing several things like, for example, noting mm -hmm. you know, how you feel uh, interacting with certain people on social media. Yeah. What are they talking about? Do you yeah. align with what they are talking about? Yeah. And if they are triggering, then can you block them or can you unfollow them? Yeah. Or not interact with them even, you know, or limit the interaction I'm, I'm saying there is such a yeah. wide spectrum in this yeah right yeah so i think boundaries would be an interesting word to establish here absolutely in management yeah you know like mm -hmm. okay i'm going to you know i'm going to read about so this can it's interesting like one thing like this question is uh, make you know make, making me think of is how even just reading about body as a subject can be very triggering it has happened to me and it's yes. not necessarily about fashion about yeah. looks i'm just like reading up on wellness and it has triggered me yes so then to develop the patience to pause yeah okay this is getting too much for me i don't want this anymore Right. Though I am reading this book, let's say I'm reading this book, I'm on page 20, I want to reach 200. Okay, can I stop for now? Yeah. And not do this anymore right now. I think those are the kind of boundaries we will need when it comes to management. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a comment here, which I thought was very interesting and insightful. I think it's your mom. Uh, who says, I'm reminded of Tara Brack's mention of the trance of self-unworthiness. So do you want to weigh in on that? Trance, yeah. I mean, I haven't uh, read uh, or, you know, I don't know which part or which part of her books or what she's referring to exactly. But when I think about this phrase, what occurs to me is... Um, Unworthiness can create a spell in us. Yes. yes. You know, it, it's more like an inertia. Yes. Uh, like, okay, maybe no, no, this feels... So the discomfort becomes our, the new normal as we've gotten used to the phrase, yeah. uh, you know, around COVID. So this yeah. com discomfort becomes the new normal, then yeah. we have to go on that journey to find our worth. Yeah. Or get back to the worth that already exists. Yeah. The worth in the gray hair, the worth in the, you know, aging skin. And knowing that if we've come to life that, you know, at every point in point in time, whether we can see it or not, death is happening in some form or the other, as it happens in nature. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the trance of self-unworthiness is exactly why I demarcated between exposure and activation 
because in my own journey, I realized that when we talked about body image triggers, uh, exposure was one thing and the activation was one thing because sometimes it can build. You know, you can see 10, if you, you even something as simple as you've watched TV for one hour and you're having at least 20 minutes of advertisements and commercials, mm -hmm. almost 90% of the commercials, if it's a, for a hair care product, it is really about which college are you studying in or how young do you look, right? It's always when you talk about food, it's about I became thinner, I became slimmer, I my family got back the old me. There's mm. so much of uh, what you call it, the manipulation of mm. the of the psyche happening there. And a lot of times we don't recognize that, mm. oh, this is what's happening. So our exposure actually sets us up to have a meltdown at some point in time. Mm. Mm. It becomes, you know, there'll be always be one incident which I felt would suddenly become the camel that broke the cam, you know, the straw that broke the camel's mm. back. And suddenly you have that trigger melt, the melt off that's associated with triggers. So this was a reason why I said I wanted to separate it out because I think unless we are aware, we can't yes. help ourselves. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And knowing where our personal boundaries will be healthy for ourselves. Like, yes. you know, like on this live, it's you and me. What is a, what might be a good boundary for you might actually not work for me. So, Absolutely. you know, again, not to, I think, devolve into comparisons here because yeah. we are such different people with, diff you know, differently raised. Our, our systems are so different. Our nervous systems are different. Yes. So I think to constantly self-check, have like a self-checking mechanism. Right. And also, I think uh, one of the things that you've mentioned in the past lives, which is about pausing every time you're uncomfortable. And sitting with the discomfort, right? Like the, you can't, you can't run away from it. There's no because it will just bit snowball into something much bigger. It's always better to just sit with it as we are, uh, you know, feeling it, right? So, so just before we kind of wind up, something that I really want to ask, and this is, you know, something that I'm very curious about. So we triggered, and then we may be in a tailspin, right? Assuming we are in a tailspin, how mm -hmm. can, how do we how can we stage an intervention for ourselves so that we can reclaim our center of balance and really take charge of the situation? You know, the reason I'm asking this question is because I have seen situations where you know, in conversations amongst friends, somebody says something as a joke, maybe about a person's gray hair or someone who is looking a little bloated, right? Lines are crossed, of course. You know, nobody has a right to talk about anybody else's body, but it happens. We live in a world where it's permissible. And sometimes if you see people laugh it off, and then we have seen people who have just had huge meltdowns, right? Mm -hmm. And one of and the reason I ask this question is a lot of times I find that people are not able to help themselves in the force of that emotion. But when that emotion abates and then they've had that meltdown, what is left is shame. It's compounds the problem. It doesn't make it better, right? So is there any intervention you can suggest that, you know, we can keep in our minds? So anytime we feel ourselves kind of going a little off our track and being behaving in a way that we are not comfortable with, right? Like, I don't want to do this, but I, how do I stop myself from being this person? What can we do? Hmm. So because this is about body image, um, I think um when a meltdown happens when it has sometimes happened to me in the past it has happened to friends mm -hmm. uh, women i know people i know uh, even men i've heard uh, from some yeah. um i think the experience is of an onslaught from the outside yeah. to be able to remember that the onslaught is extrinsic hmm. Hmm. Now, let's say somebody has made a comment yeah so even in that moment i would still say to pause yeah and then ask what else is there in my life apart from this comment hmm. you know what is working well for me 
what am I enjoying about myself right now? Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, recently I was reading something and it said, oh, tell yourself beauty is not skin deep. And I, it did not sit, it did not sit well with me because I felt like in a, in a really crucial situation, you can't really say that verbatim to yourself because if you could, then you wouldn't be in that situation. Oh my God, it's like, <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's that counterintuitive, okay. <laughs> so no, my, also, also, if I may say so, I think that's very toxic because you know what? We all want to be beautiful, mm-hmm. right? We all want to be beautiful. The way I see it is there's nothing wrong in it, but... The problem we have is when we don't define beauty for ourselves or we are not able to delight in what's beautiful with mm-hmm. within us. And we are looking at some actress and saying, oh, that's beauty. It's not the face in the mirror, but it's really, you know, something on the glossy pages of a magazine. That's where I see a problem. So I'm with you on that, that it doesn't sit well at all with me. Yeah, absolutely. So if we don't like a statement like that, so my then my attempt would be, okay, I don't like this statement that beauty is not skin deep. No, that there is a truth there. Now, what is the truth? Can I yeah. pull out the truth? Now, the truth is, okay, what it means is my visual, the visual idea that I have of me and the visual idea that people have of me mm-hmm. isn't the only thing about me. Yeah. I might be doing great work. Yeah. I might be a wonderful friend. Yeah. I might be finishing, you know, I might be a good reader who, you you know, who is able to process and finish five books in a month. Yeah. I might be handling a really, really tough project and I am doing a great job at it. You know, I'm laughing because the thought that came to my head is maybe they just have bad taste. (laughs) I mean, who is anybody to tell me I'm not beautiful in any context? Absolutely. Right, like absolutely. So yeah. So I think what I'm trying to say here is to go back to a little bit of what you were saying earlier is mm-hmm. to take out time, yeah. really sit with ourselves, mm-hmm. and see what we truly, personally find beautiful. Because if we are able to define that, yeah, no matter what onslaught comes from outside. Yeah. It cannot touch us. Yeah. Or even if it does, we can always wobble back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, I think what what I mean by it cannot touch us is okay. If I touch us, but then it goes. You know, it's like a. It's yeah. like you're playing squash in a in a squash court with yourself. Yeah. Like the ball comes, you you hit, yeah. and it's gone. Yeah. Gone for that moment. You right. it, you're not like heaving under its pressure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. some of the, it also comes down, like you very rightly pointed out, Sunanda, it also comes down to boundaries. You know, it's really about boundaries. One of the things that I did was change the people around me. <laughs> because, because my, I think, I think, you know, one, when you take stock and you realize that you think you're beautiful, but who you are with matters. It matters so much. Absolutely. And it's not possible to maintain this sense of beauty and self-worth and have a good image no matter how fantastic you are if you have if you're okay you can't control our social exposure or your exposure on tv and magazines but you can definitely manage your exposure to people right and set those boundaries right absolutely and i would add another layer to this Mm -hmm. um you know uh, there are certain relationships that you can't change or drop yeah um, and there are boundaries there as well, uh, yeah. because women have come to me saying this, you know, this was yeah. said to me by a very close friend. I can't, you know, even think of losing, then say no, you know, yeah. as, as, as nasty and stern as I <laughs> sounded <laughs> right now, like, and yeah. I know that this is, you, you see how I am also self talking to myself on the show. I am just saying that this is an example of how we women talk to ourselves because the moment I raise my voice, I'm being stern, but hell no, I'm not being stern. I'm just saying, this is where my boundary lies and you cannot talk to me like this. And that's it. And if the person is able to listen to us in that moment, 
Yeah. Then they are still our person. Yeah. But if they are being whatever, yeah. then I think the next steps are to be thought of. Okay, how much exposure? How much do I want to interact with this person? Yeah, right. Absolutely. You know, I think one of the things, one of the best piece of advice I received from one of my mentors was, you don't have to answer anything immediately. You can go back, take your time, find out what's comfortable for you, go back and find a way that works for you. And the one of the best things about doing that is you suddenly realize that, hey, you know what? I don't need to take this from anybody. Mm -hmm. I can just say this. I can just say my piece and draw that line. And if they don't respect it, then I can then decide what is in my best interest because I owe myself that much, right? Absolutely. So anyway, I think we've come to the top of the hour and uh, I can see quite a few people have been leaving in and out. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has joined us. Nanda, any last words before we sign up for the evening? Um, I'm wondering, <laughs> I feel like I've spoken so much. Um, I think I'm just going to say this, that um, anybody who is struggling with body image issues, whether it's a woman or, you know, someone watching who needs to tend to a younger person. Yeah. I think talking about the discomfort is very important. Yeah. As much as we, and I, I think, Rekha, I'm going back to how we started and you were yeah. saying so much yeah. of the discomfort develops because we do not have spaces. We don't make spaces for ourselves where we can just say, you know what? Oh God, this doesn't sit. Yeah. Right. You know, so I think talk, uh, express if something is not sitting with you. Because I think internalization begins when we do not express. Absolutely. Acknowledging it. Acknowledging Absolutely. the discomfort is very Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Anyway, thank you so much, Sunanda, for this really interesting conversation. I think we've gone you know, we've, we've flowed as always, but we've covered a lot of ground and this has been a very fascinating conversation. So as always, I'm extremely grateful to you for, you know, the depth, the enthusiasm and the, and the heart you bring to our conversation. And I want to say thank you to everybody who has been watching this live with us. I want to thank uh, Tara Aunty for all the comments and particularly for you know the reference to the trance of self unworthiness i think that's really stuck in my head today and uh, you know anybody else who's going to be watching this in the next 24 48 hours we hope you've enjoyed it if you need to reach out to sunanda she's on instagram she's on facebook she's on linkedin she's tagged on all my posts over there please do feel to reach out to her she's a fantastic uh, healer who really helps us get in touch with our bodies. And uh, just want to say thank you to everybody.